Let me ask you a question. Is what... What is church? If I were to ask you a question, what is church, what would you say? How would you answer that question? You can call it out. You can say it out loud. What is church? Something to look forward to. Okay. All right. Fellowship. Fellowship. Anybody else? Place to worship. Place to worship. What? I... Worship. Worship. Anybody else? That's good. Those are all good because nobody said building, which is really good. Because some people, when you say, what is church, they'll, they'll point at a building, and there's, there's tons of churches around. There's tons of church buildings around. They'll point at a building and say, that's church. And, you know, think about this. How many churches did you pass up to get to this one this morning? I've asked people that question for a long time. How many churches do you pass up to get to the one you go to? And why? Which we're not going to talk too much about that today, but... But if someone landed from Mars, and in 2020, that might not be too beyond the pale. <laughs> it might not be that unusual. If somebody landed from Mars and asked you, what is church, what would you say to them? That's the question. What would you tell them that church is? See, we picked four areas to pray for here in October. We prayed for our personal lives. We prayed for our family lives. We're praying for the church, and we're focusing on that this week. And then over the next week and into to next uh, Sunday, Brett will be talking about praying for our culture, praying for our, our government, and praying that good things happen there. Because the Bible tells us if we pray for the ones who rule over us, then we pray that things will go right with us. If they do well, we will do well, and that's what we pray for. So... When we get to the book of Ephesians, Paul gives us a little bit of information here on what he believes that the church is all about. So when you get to Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, and you look at verse 11, verse 11 through 16, Ephesians chapter 4, Paul starts talking about functions of the church. He stops talking, and there's not this uh, thing up here where, you know, your 10,000-foot view of what the church is. He starts dialing in. He's saying, let me, let me land this plane for you. Let me tell you what the church is. And he says in verse 11, these are the gifts that Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do His work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. See, there's a standard. What's the standard? Not my own standard. It's the standard of Christ that I need to be measuring up to. We'll no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced by people who try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of the, church, the body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body, the church, is healthy and growing and full of, what's it say? Love. We know that Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Paul just said it there, and Paul also said in the Colossians. So we know that the church is not a building, but the church is a group of people who gather together for the purpose of expressing the kingdom of God. Our purpose is to do His will. It's the kingdom of God. So we are people who are infused with God. That's what He wants us to be, infused with God. And so there is a word that Jesus used for it. It's called ekklesia. There's a Greek word for it. It's called ekklesia. It means the gathering. And this people come together because they are filled up with God. They have a mindset that expresses godly things in every area of life. They have a mindset that expresses godly things in every area of life that expresses godly 
things in every area of life. And so Jesus, when he talked about this ecclesia, he says it's a gathering. It's people coming out of their homes into some public area. In other words, it's not being a secret agent Christian. It's not hiding behind, yeah, I'm a Christian, I just don't talk about it. He's not calling that church. He's saying, you come out, come out publicly and say, hey, come out and serve me. Represent me to the public. So it's a purpose of deliberately gathering and speaking for the Lord those things that he values. Hit that next slide, guys. It's kingdom values. The ecclesia, the, the kingdom of God, has certain things we represent. Certain things we represent, and those are values. The kingdom, uh, expresses, uh, the kingdom expressions are the values of God. So it's values of, of right and wrong, you know. In home, at work, wherever we go. It's not just being good in here. Everybody's it's good in church, generally, right? <laughs> or it's like what, pe what people, I heard a guy say, here's what, here's what the truth is about preachers. Preachers, preachers are paid to be good. Everybody else is good for nothing. <laughs> okay, we're dismissed. No, I'm sorry. Did I lose you yet? Okay. <laughs> So the values of God are what is right, what is wrong, by God's definition of that, not by our own. We live every day by the character of God. What does the character of God look like? Because you can keep that plane up here about 10,000 feet. Yes, I believe in the character of God. What does that mean? What does it look like? Well, the character of God is love, because we know God is love. And also is joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. God's character, he wants us to represent his character. So what does his character look like? It looks like that. And then he wants us to follow, he wants us to express his commands. There's responsibilities of relationship. Responsibilities of relationship are keeping his commandments. And Jesus said, you know what, my commandments aren't heavy. They're not burdensome. In fact, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. I'm not giving you a bunch of stuff you can't do. I'm giving you stuff you can do. And so his commands, first of all, is love. Because love, what? Covers a multitude of sin. Right. And so beyond that, some of the expression of the kingdom of God is helping other people become disciples. Helping other people become disciples. See, you can't do that if we're hiding. We can't do that if we're a secret agent Christian. But sharing the goodness of God and the good news to others, because we're saying, hey, let me tell you what I used to be like. I used to be hateful. I used to say horrible things. I used to be critical and condemning of other people, but God healed me of that. Amen. Or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully, God has healed us of that kind of thing, right? And so those are the types of things that helping other disciples say, let me show you. It isn't just head knowledge. We're not just talking about stuff. You come to the church and get head knowledge. He really did something in me because I used to be a horrible person that way. Not by my own standards, but by God's standards. You know, if I'm critical, condemning, always griping, complaining, you know, or whatever. Because God holds all that stuff in line with some heavy-duty sin. When you look all that stuff up and he's going, none of this looks like me. I want you, my people who are called by my name, to look like me, to look like Jesus Christ. And so the function of the church is to take all those things with us wherever we go. As individual people, as members of the church, Jesus told us to go into where? All the world. Go to all the world. Have I lost you already? Are you with me? Go all the world. Go into all the world. Teach others the things that Jesus taught us. Wasn't that video great? Can you imagine? What was it that was 2%? Only 2% of the world? 2.5% or under. Are Christians. Yep. Which means 98% are not, right? I, I can do the simple math. 98% of the world. I didn't even need a calculator for that one. Get stuff out of the way here. 98% of the world needs to hear this good news. God can't use us if we're secret agent Christians. Because, well, I mean, he can use us. But the point is we aren't doing anything for secret agent Christians. So the function of the church is to take all of these things and go. Life is better. We have the message. Life is better lived in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? 
Can you tell someone life is better lived with Jesus Christ than it is without it, without him? Life is better lived with Jesus Christ than without him. There's a cold breeze blowing in here today. Life is better lived with Jesus Christ than without him. Our purpose in our mission as the church is to tell others. That's what he wants. And this is not just head knowledge. See, we trade off. We'll trade off a checklist of, I went to church and I learned about things and someone inspired me and I heard songs that I liked and it was awesome. And that thing will take you just so far and then after a while it's like, yeah, I forgot. What, what, did, they, what did that guy talk about on Sunday morning? Because I'll bet you by Wednesday most of you won't remember what I say today. Because <laughs> I didn't. When I'm sitting in the pew, I'm going, what did he talk about Sunday? And by next Sunday, I've completely forgot. Right? But... Here's what you don't forget. You never forget what God has done for you. Amen. You never forget what Jesus has done for you. You never forget how he's changed you. You never forget the goodness that he does in you. Amen. So this isn't about head knowledge. This is about heart knowledge. So there was a discussion. Jesus and his disciples were having a discussion one time. And they're talking, you know. I'm thinking they're walking and talking. And Jesus is saying to him, well, what do people say about me? What are they telling you about me? And, and the disciples were saying, well, some of you say you're John the Baptist. Some of you are, you know, one of the prophets and all that. And he said, I don't care. What do you all say about me? Who do you think that I am? So in Matthew 16, hit that next slide, guys. Matthew 16, verses 15 through 19. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Did, I might have messed those two up. Yeah. Okay, that's okay. Just leave that one there. Or go back to the other one with me, if you will. Matthew 16, verses 15 through 19. Jesus is asking these guys a question. I want to know what you guys think I, who you guys think I am. And he said, and who do you th say I am? And P Simon Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, you are blessed, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you, you are a Peter. You're a rock. You're a stone, it says. But upon this rock, not Peter, but upon the rock that you just mouth came out of your, the words that came out of your mouth, that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, that's the rock I'm going to build my ecclesia on. That's the rock I'm building my church on. And the gates of hell will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And if we had time, we'd talk about that. I'm not going to have time to talk about that today. But we'll talk about it sometime. But basically what he is saying here is, is that, that the church is more powerful than whatever hell can throw at it. Amen. You are, I am, we are the church. Therefore what? If A equals B and B equals C, what does A equal? C. If the gates of hell will not prevail against the church and we are the church, then the gates of hell cannot prevail over us if we are connected to Jesus Christ. So what that is saying is not only is Jesus Christ love, and he is love, but he is power. He has all authority. He is able to keep us safe in the storm. It does not, do not hear why I'm not saying, <laughs> does not mean you won't have a storm. It does not mean things won't go right. It does not mean there are days you go, I wish this day would be over. Or years you go, I wish this year would be over. Right? Because Jesus was perfectly in the way. I love this. this. is the best example I can find out of the Bible. Jesus said to the disciples, I want to go to the other side. They're going, ah, oh, we're in the will of Jesus. We're going to the other side with Jesus. And they get in a huge storm to the point they thought they were going to lose their lives. And they wake Jesus up and say, don't you even care we're going to die. Is that a prayer we've ever prayed? <laughs> Don't you even care? We're going to die. And he says, oh, I'm with you. So you can be in the will of Jesus and still have to go through a storm. Are you with me? Okay. In Acts 1.8, now you can hit that one, guys. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus told his people, this was the disciples, but this is through them and to us, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. So the church is more than a building, isn't it? 
It was cool to see them building that, that church. The church is more than a building. The church is a collection of people worldwide who have been forgiven our sins because we have expressed faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. Those of us who have made Jesus Christ Savior and Lord are the church. And the church is more than just a place for religious education and information, isn't it? It's good that we can come here, and it's nice that we have, you know, a great place we can come. But there's more to this than just about getting education and leaving. Not that there's anything wrong with learning more about the Lord. And not that we can't explore it, because I think God wants us to explore it. But I think it's more than just that. It's, it is being part of what His plan is, and that is to be an empowered group of people. He wants His church to be an empowered group of people. He said the... Holy Spirit will give you power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And he said about his church, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That does not mean the gates of hell won't try, right? Okay. So if Jesus has all authority, he says the church will stand against the gates of hell, and we have been given power through the Holy Spirit, then let me ask you a question. Why does the church seem so powerless today? I'm doing a class, I'm taking a class. Um, it's kind of like a, a, a localized MCI, MLI, like we've done. Um, and it's called Pioneering the Church. And one of the things is to find out kind of how people feel like, how people have been disenfranchised with the church. Let me explain something to you. I stood in another place in another time, center stage, leading worship in a church, and I was disenfranchised. Because there were people hating on me from the songs I picked to the way I sung them to the this and that, right? Nobody was happy. So it kind of disenfranchised me. It was like, if I, if I hadn't known, if I had been 20 years younger, I might have just quit. In fact, I wanted to quit and go join a bluegrass band a time or two. <laughs> That's gotta be easier than this. And I will tell you the truth. I will tell you the truth. The words came out of my mouth. I quit. I'm not going back. And God said, yeah, you are. You're not quitting. Because part of that was another connection God was doing for me. But I'm just telling you that I have been center stage leading worship. I've got a witness over here. I've got a witness over there. And it was like, I, this is pointless. I have been disenfranchised from the church. I felt that way. So I want to talk to people. I've been talking to people about why, because there's people I've been talking to that go, oh, I just, I, you know, I've, you've heard me say this? Well, now I have proof. Oh, I don't know. The church has not got that much for me. I just don't know what the church has for me. Right? So I've been talking to these people, and I'm just listening. I'm not debating. I just want to know why you think this. Well, to some people, and it's not just younger people. There are people my age, and I'm not that old. <laughs> In my head. Um, there are people my age who are going, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what the church has for me. There are people like that who say the church is irrelevant, and the church can't meet my needs, because all the church is about is just getting more information. If it's just getting more information, well then, I, there, I, I can get information anywhere. I can listen to a podcast, I can watch YouTube video, I can watch stuff on TV, I can read a book, I can get information. I'm not sure what the church brings to me. And so, I tell you all that, that's my opening. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I tell you all that to say, why do we pray and fast? Well, here's why we pray and fast. Because we need to be able to connect with everything that Jesus said we are. He said he has all authority. He says that the gates of hell will not prevail. He says that we have power in his Holy Spirit. And if we have all of that, then we have to be stronger than what we are. Guys, I can stand behind a mic if it'll help. You're going to chain me back to the mic. I thought I was free, and they dragged me right back here. All right. We come to the church so that 
we can be what he wants us to be. We want to be inspired. We want, to, we want all of these things. But none of that happens unless we pray and fast. We dedicated October to pray and fast. And here's the deal. That it is the connection point to us. It is the connection point from us to God to pray and fast. To access the power. If you don't plug in your phone, what happens? Battery goes dead, right? So you plug in your phone to power so that it recharges. And that is what prayer and fasting does for us. It, it recharges us. It renews us. It re-strengthens the phone and it re-strengthens us to plug into a power source. And the only power source that we have available to us as God's people who are called by name, His name is through the Holy Spirit and into Jesus Christ. So when we pray and when we fast, we are connecting to the only thing that can really truly renew us. Praying and fasting as an individual member of the connected group makes us vibrant and powerful and united. Are you with me? You see the Holy Spirit working in the Old Testament and you see the Spirit working in the New Testament. The Holy Spirit brings life. How do we know this? Because it says in Genesis, the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. That God breathed into man the breath of life. We see the Holy Spirit again moving on the day of Pentecost. So you got three examples. There's more, but there's three examples. And the word that's used is pneuma. P-N-E-U-N-A. Pneuma. Where we get our word for pneumonia from. But it is a breath. It is a giving of a breath. And sometimes it's quiet and gentle, and sometimes it's like a mighty rushing wind. But without breath, none of us have life. God breathed into Adam the breath of life, and God breathed into the church the life on that day of Pentecost that gave us life and gave us access to the power. So if we want to stay connected to that, we need to stay connected through the Holy Spirit. So here's the deal. I just want to see if anybody caught that. All the politicians are saying that phrase right now. Here's the deal. <laughs> Some of you got it. <laughs> I'm just making sure you they haven't lost me. Some of the people I've talked to, and it, this is their honest opinion, is that the church isn't relevant. Um, and there are, I, I just, I'll throw this out this way. I, People feel what they feel because of the emotion attached to it. You with me? I mean, sometimes it's hard to separate ourselves from the emotion of the feeling, even though maybe what the feeling is is not the absolute accurate way it is. And so churches have tried to be relevant, and I'm not, this isn't bad, I'm not railing or criticizing or anything, but churches have tried to, to be relevant by, being, by creating newer things, and, and believe me, I like new things. We all like a new car. We all not like new clothes. We all like new, I like, you know, new stuff. And so we've done these things, but sometimes people have said that, and I've talked to people here recently who said, yeah, that we've got a great building facility, it's just something's not working for me. I'm going, hmm. Because, theoretically, it should, right? So if it's not relevant based on the stuff, there's something else missing. There's something else wrong. So if Jesus Christ is the head of the church, what do we know about Jesus Christ? He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Therefore, he's just as vibrant today as he was in the beginning. Right? He is just as vibrant today as then. If he is just as vibrant today as then, and he is the head of the church, what does that mean? That means that the church should be just as vibrant because there's nothing wrong with the one who's running it. Right? Amen. So if there's nothing wrong with the one who's running it, I'm going I'm I'm to steal a term that's being used in another way. If there's a systemic problem with the church, okay? If there's a systemic relevancy problem then you have to chase down the system. Who put the system in place? Jesus Christ. Is he the same yesterday, today, and forever? Which means a thousand years from now, he'll be just as vibrant as he is today, as he was then, right? 
So if we say, well, the church is not doing anything for me, what's the problem? Is it our leader? Is it his system? It just means something's not connecting. Let me just cut to the point. My belief is that what's missing is our connection with the Holy Spirit. I think our connection with the Holy Spirit through prayer and through fasting renews us. Yeah. It strengthens us. Yeah. It helps us see things we can't see on our own. So if there's a lack of power and forward motion today in the church, can I suggest this? Let us reconnect with the Holy Spirit, through the Holy Spirit to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who is just as vibrant as he ever has been. So, if you're feeling, and this is not a feel good, okay? This is not, I'm not pastor feel good here. To give you a, taking a street term here. To give you a little something, something to make you feel better for a short time. This is not the point. The point is this, that if you're going, ah, I'm kind of feeling that way too. I'm kind of feeling like church is, I'm disconnected from it. Or it's disconnected itself from me. Maybe that's the feel. Let me just say this. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. We receive the Holy Spirit. It is our gift at the time of salvation. But just like the phone that needs to be recharged on the battery, sometimes we need that refilling. Amen. We need that recharging. We just need something new, something to energize us, something to say, mm, I got it, I, 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 I just feel like God's got it for me. And sometimes what Satan does, the gates of hell, are stealing our peace, and they're stealing, it's trying to steal our joy, and it's trying to steal our satisfaction. But if we pray, if God's people will, who are called by his name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek his face and turn from our wicked ways, God says, I'll hear you. I'll hear you. When you put yourself in that mindset that says, Lord, I, I want to reconnect with you. What that verse is saying is that if God's people will reconnect with him, we won't feel so disconnected. Right? And the Holy Spirit will begin to do a new work in us to reconnect us, to renew us, to restore us. And, and a word that we don't use a whole lot anymore, but it still has value, to revive us. Amen. All right, let me put it in 21st century. To recharge our battery. Need my battery recharged. Praying and fasting regularly connects you and me to the power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus talked about. So you look at what happened on the day of Pentecost, that day when they were in a little bitty room, but the Spirit moved so hard and so fast and so mighty on them, the room could not contain them. So they didn't stay in the room and go out to the street and say, hey, you all need to come to our room. Come to our room so we can tell you about the Lord. What did they do? They went out, right? That's, that was the, the visual expression of the ecclesia. That's the visual expression of God's people. Not anything wrong with being in here. I'd rather be in here than out there cold. <laughs> um, but we didn't come here to stay.